Okay. I've got some people commenting. They can hear me fine. All right. I'll go ahead and get started. Even though the screen may say my name is Russ Nordstrand, I'm the other Russ in the group. I'm Russell Graves. Uh, we have to log in under a, kind of a central uh, username and password. It's all registered under Russ Nordstrand's name. But again, my name is Russell Graves, as you can see in the, in the slide below. Uh, today's presentation is called Thinking Beyond the Telephoto. And I was thinking about this today as I was refining this and looking back through my presentation. Originally, it had a different subtitle of Thinking of the Crap Beyond a Telephoto Lens. And so I kind of modified a little bit, capturing nature photos that don't only rely on a telephoto lens. Uh, a couple of these techniques we may see today, you know, may require a telephoto lens, but it's a way to modify it in ways that you haven't thought of. In all, I've got five different things I'm going to talk about. It's not a real extensive list, but it may give you a, a couple of ways of thinking about wildlife and nature photography and how to capture dynamic images in a way that you haven't seen before. So as we go through this uh, presentation, I'm uh, as we go through the presentation, let me know if you have any, any questions as I go through, through this. You know, like always, I want these to be a, a dialogue and not a monologue. So Again, if you have any questions, just pop them in there. I'll answer them as I go through it and uh, hopefully teach a few things. And, and I've got so towards the end, I've got I want to ask you a question. And so as I go through this, be thinking about what's your ways of capturing uh, photography or wildlife photos or nature photos. that's a little innovative and it doesn't just require just a simple camera and lens technique. So as I go through this, be thinking about that. Feel free to share with them at, with everybody at the end. You can top them in here to me. I'll in turn turn around and tell everybody else, and uh, we'll just learn from one another. So the first thing I want to talk about is stacking teleconverters. You know, everyone's heard of teleconverters before. They're that little piece of glass that you can put between your camera and lens, and it gives you a little bit more power. Like, for example, I use religiously, I use a 500-millimeter telephoto lens for uh, wildlife photography, but I often put a 1.4 converter on that lens, which makes it effectively a 720 millimeter lens. Now, a few times in some real specific situations, you can actually stack the teleconverter lenses. Uh, for example, if, if I was to take a 500 millimeter lens and add a 1.4 converter, uh, I said 720, it'd make it 700 millimeters. There you go. I'm using my calculator as my cheat sheet. But, not only can I add the 1.4 converter, I can also add a 2x converter, which gives me 1,400 millimeters. And so I can turn my 500 millimeter lens in my full frame body into a 400, 1,400 millimeter lens. Now, what I like using for is like the scene you see here. It, if you've got a moonrise or a moonset, you can really get some strikingly unusual images of the moon in that big. Uh, by seeing it that big in the frame. And so on this picture that you're looking at here, all I did was stack teleconverters, shot a picture of the moon against that windmill. Uh, this was up in the Texas panhandle. Now the uh, the way the moon is, is looks kind of squashed. That's diffraction of it traveling through all the, the light rays. Of, I mean, all the air, air that it had, the light has to travel through, you know, just like sunrise or sunset when the sun comes up or goes down you still have that sort of the sun sometimes looks squished and that's the effect we've got here. But to make it appear that big, I was shooting at 1400 millimeters. Now, I don't know about other camera manufacturers, but the thing about Canon teleconverters are, if you're gonna stack them, you've got to put one of those 12 millimeter extension tubes between them because they actually have an element that sticks out a little bit. So you've got to create a little bit of space, but stacking tele teleconverters works great when you're shooting moon pictures. It also works great uh, when you're shooting pictures of, of any kind of wildlife that's up close where you need a little bit more magnification. Now, here's the downside when you stack teleconverters. You'll lose typically three stops of light, and you're probably, on most camera bodies, you're going to use lose the ability to autofocus. So that's the downside to it. So, uh, and every, everyone know. I'm assuming everyone knows that with a 1.4 converter, you'll lose one stop a lot. So essentially, instead of shooting at one five hundredth of a second, you may have to shoot at one two fiftieth of a second. But then when you add the 2x converter, again, you're lo losing three stops of light. So it makes the whole system a little bit slower, and it makes the auto, it makes you have to manually autofocus. But again, 
this isn't something I use all the time. And in fact, none of the techniques I'll talk about, I use all the time, but they're little tricks I can kind of keep in the back of my mind, sort of in my proverbial camera bag and be able to use them whenever I need to. Now, another thing, if you're shooting birds or something like that close up, it works reasonably well. You still maintain a lot of sharpness. You will lose some sharpness, but you can maintain it. But with any teleconverter, the more air you shoot through, and this is something a lot of people don't think about when I talk about it on some of the backcountry journeys tours, you can you can probably theoretically continue to stack teleconverters and make like a 5,000 millimeter lens. But the problem you get into is the more air you shoot through, that air is full of dust and particulates and uh, just the haze of having to shoot through more air. So the more air you have to shoot through, the softer your images are going to be. That's why if you look at this picture really, really, really close, that windmill's not exactly tack sharp and the moon is certainly not sharp because we're looking through a lot of air looking at that. Oh, my nose is itching. Are, so Brenda asked the question, are the teleconverters automatic? And I'm not sure what you mean by that, Brenda. So if you could clarify, I'd be happy to answer that question. So while I'm waiting on Brenda to re-ask the question, I'll go ahead and go to the next one. Last week, I was in the Smoky Mountains with the group, and uh, one of the things I encouraged them to bring if they had it was either a macro lens or extension tubes. And extension tubes are a wonderful uh, invention that sometimes I see people use, but oftentimes I don't. And all an extension tube is, it's just a, if you look at this, so this looks a lot like a teleconverter, but the difference is it doesn't have any glass in it. It's just empty throughout. Now, I'm no optical physicist, and I can't explain why this does this, but when you put an extension tube between the lens and the camera body, it changes the close focusing ability of that lens. And essentially, it makes your telephoto lens, like I use mine a lot with a, uh, I use my extension tubes a lot with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. And when you add that extension tube in between, instead of having like a three meter close focusing distance, it'll be like an eight inch close focusing distance. So you can have a, a cheap uh, macro lens in that regard. And I use extension tubes a lot. The uh, When we were on the trip last week, uh, someone bought a third party set of extension tubes. Cost them like 40 bucks, but they use it all the time. It works great for flower photography. Uh, like all of these were taken with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. I actually shot these last week. You are the first, second ones to see them. I'm the first ones to see them, but uh, we have a just a, a miniature iris there in the upper right. And uh, I believe those are flocks in the lower right. And then the, uh, and then that is mountain dog hobble on the left. It's a shrub species, but it's got beautiful bell-like flowers. But all these were shot using extension tubes. And again, uh, the cool thing about them is, and I think this is what Brenda means. Uh, she clarified she meant extension tubes. The cool thing about extension tubes are the ones I use on my Canon cameras is you retain autofocus and you retain all the functionality of your lens. So in other words, they communicate, they help your lens communicate with the camera to figure out what the, you know, what the, the, to be able to meter the light. And so they work great. And one of the things I'm going to do a little different than I've done on videos. And I mean, that I've done on the webinars in the past, I've got a couple of videos through here. I'm going to show you as we go along. And uh, so if I go silent for a second, it was just to watch a video. And I think the next one, yeah, here we go. I'm going to launch this video. And if, uh, I think you should be able to hear it.
Okay, I, I'm getting a couple of messages. The video is choppy and there's no sound on the video. I'll direct you towards the end where you can see those videos, and I apologize for that. Uh, I don't, I don't, must be a technical issue. I don't know what's going on there. So I'll go ahead and continue, which may mean we may end up a little bit early today because I'd make my entire plan on this presentation based on uh, having a couple of videos to show you. But if that's not working out in the end, I've got a place where you can go watch those. I'll, I'll retell you the names of the, uh, videos if you want to go watch them on your own. So again, my apologies for the choppy video. I'm not sure what kind of technical issues that we are uh, having there. So uh, continue on. One of the, an, another innovation that I like to use in wildlife photography is an aquarium. Now you may be asking what kind of aquarium are you talking about? I own two or three of these. They're, I think last time I checked, they're a 10 gallon aquarium. I think they cost about 10 or $15 at say a local Walmart. Uh, they're pretty cheap, but the benefit of them is if you're working with really small animals or like insects or anything like that, you can build a temporary habitat inside of these, uh, these aquariums. And a lot of times if I'm working with something like, I'll show you these pictures. A lot of times if I'm working with something like uh, this lizard, which was a threatened species or endangered species. Actually, I didn't, uh, I didn't capture those myself, but I was working with a wildlife biologist. We were doing a story for a magazine. And so he was actually capturing these lizards to uh, put a pit tag in them, which a pit tag is a passive. Uh, I forgot what they mean, but a pit tag is an internal tag. They use them a lot in dogs that you can put a little tag under the skin and later on you can identify that animal without, you know, any kind of external tag hanging off the animal. Uh, and so the way we did these pictures, if you look at that picture there is that that lizard was inside of a tank just like this one. And so to kind of break it down, well, I'm going to go back one more time. All I did was got sa sand from the surrounding areas you can see the color of the sand in the foreground matches the color in the background. This is actually in some sand hills out in eastern New Mexico where we shot this picture. And so I got sand from the surrounding uh, terrain and uh, and just threw a few sticks in there and made approximated the habitat as best I could. And then we actually, uh, a few more technical information on this. You can see it's got a real nice soft light. It was a little bit overcast that day, but another thing as I did is I have a, a scrim that I put over the top of the of the aquarium and actually fired a flash from the top to help mimic that top down light. And so that's how we lit these. And Hilda asked, do you find that taking photos through cheap aquarium glass hurts your image quality? I really don't think it does, especially that's why I have so many because the minute these things get scratched up, I just go buy a new one. Uh, they're not, again, they're not very expensive at all. But when you need to use it for small animals like this, it really works. In fact, that picture right there was the cover of that magazine, that particular issue about that lizard. So the image was sharp. Uh, the technique worked. And again, it's a great way to shoot pictures of small animals that you may be trying to photograph. And, you know, you use your ethics when you do this. I mean, all these animals, we were they were unhurt, turned loose again That when we shot these pictures. And... Uh, but again, it was just a good way to tr help illustrate it. Again, like the crayfish in the bottom, people call them crayfish. We call them crawdads where I live. But the crawdad in the bottom, again, caught out of a pond on my own property because I was working on another project about uh, for a magazine about, about animals of the wetlands. And, uh, you know, it's easy to take pictures of, of uh, great white, uh, the, the big white egrets, the great white egrets, feeding on crawfish, but it's another level to try to take a picture of the crawfish, especially when they live in muddy water. And so what I did is caught a couple. We did it right stream side. I may have had to, I may have had these things captive for uh, maybe a, a minute or two at a time. And so what we did was capture some, use the same water they were living in, didn't use tap water. We just, we just dipped water and dipped the dirt out of the wetland. I say we, I had my son help me just dip the water and the dirt out of the uh pond let it settle a little bit so it wasn't as murky and then uh carefully place the crawfish in the same water at the same temperature because again these are these are cold 
blooded animals and so they react to their to the ambient temperatures around them so we didn't want to put it give me any kind of shock and uh put them in the in the tank shot a few pictures of them maybe five minutes worth of pictures take them back out and uh, slowly or slowly introduce them back into the water from which they came and again it's a good way of shooting pictures of animals that you may have a tough time corralling or getting pictures of otherwise And this is one of my favorite techniques I've been using a lot lately is camera traps. And again, this one has a video attached to it. So uh, my apologies if uh, if I'm going to try the video one more time. And if it is choppy and doesn't work, just let me know and we'll go through that. But really the camera traps uh, is something I've been using a lot lately. And it's just a really, really good technique. And I absolutely love, love doing it. But and as you can see... This is a, a housing that you can buy from a company called camtraptions.com, I think it is. It's C-A-M. <coughs> it's a play on contraptions, but it's C-A-M-T-R-A-P-T-I-O-N-S is uh, where you can buy these housings. But essentially what you do is you're making a, uh, you're making a, uh, like a game camera like hunters use. You can go to like Cabela's or Bass Pro and buy these little game cameras that shoot both photos and video, but the cameras are pretty low quality that they use in those game cameras. But essentially you're making the same thing except using a, a more expensive DSLR. Now, one of the questions I get from people periodically when I talk about camera traps are, do you put your most expensive cameras in there? And, and typically I don't. I will put the cameras that I don't ever sell my cameras. And so I may have one that's 10 years old, like for example, the one I put in there now is a Canon 40D that I have. Uh, I don't know how how long ago that camera came out. Still has good image quality, still works good, but I'll use that one. So in the, in the case that I may lose the camera, uh, whether someone steal it, or which that's never happened to me, or some something drags it off and I can't find it, and that has happened to me, uh, I'm not losing a whole lot. So the last time I deployed my camera trap was back in... I think early January and that's a little bit what the video is about uh, when I went back to get it the camera was still there but my external flash that I had the external flash the external battery and the uh, and the wireless flash controller that I had separated off camera from the main camera it was gone and I've I've scoured not only have I scoured the property my son's been down there looking with me. Uh, my wife's been down there looking with me. My brother, who goes to the same property often, has looked for it. I've got a friend who is looking for one of his lost cows down there. I told him to be on the lookout for it. And so I don't know what happened, but it looks like aliens abducted my flash, my battery, and my wireless flash controller that was attached to that in a separate housing, and I have no clue what happened to it. I doubt if someone stole it, because if they would have stole that, they would have grabbed the camera too. But uh, my guess is some kind of animal or like a pack rat probably drug it off. So with the camera traps, you're able to uh, capture pictures like this. And it's, I have a lot of fun with it. And so what I'll usually do with the camera traps is find a place where the uh, animals frequent or like on the picture of the bobcat on the left, that was actually a, 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 uh, dead deer that it was feeding on and i've just put the camera out by the dead deer but it, it's pretty cool to be able to shoot pictures of wildlife with the 16 millimeter lens and that's what these are it's just a wide angle lens that's inside the housing uh and it's also pretty cool too like the picture of the two deer that's the same buck on two different occasions by the way this was on a trail right right behind my house and those deer would come and go and uh i would set up the camera at a low angle as you can see and then use the wireless flash controller and have like a studio set up. Like if you went and got pictures of your kids made or whatever with a dual flash setup, the third light is I, I consider is the, the, the sky behind it. So using a basic three light setup, like you re see and read about all the time in photography tutorials, I was able to shoot pictures of wildlife like that. And again, the three light setup is that like the one on the bottom picture of the deer on the bottom i had two external flashes at roughly 45 degree angles aimed at the deer and then i just let the 
because it was illuminated well and I knew the sky would be dark. Uh, it, the sky is ultimately my third light. The picture above, I can tell you just because of the way the shadows fall, that one of the flashes didn't fire in that picture. So I've got a flash from the camera left firing, and then I've got the backlight of the sky. The cool thing about it is on using camera traps on the picture below, on the, on the lower right-hand corner of the deer, you can't really see it in this picture, or I don't think you can. I can't really see them that well, but uh, you can see stars in the sky. And so to be able to capture the secret life of wildlife at night and be able to capture it with the high-quality digital cameras, it's a, it's a pretty cool setup. There's a few more pictures and that, that bobcat, that's a different angle after I moved the camera because that bobcat would try to move that deer carcass and hide it. And I'd keep moving the camera with it every time I would go down there and check on the camera every couple of days. And there you can see she's uh, she's winking at the camera. And that's a pretty cool story in itself. I, I did a story for a magazine called The Secret Life of Bobcats. And through my research, I found out that uh the highest concentration of bobcats in Texas, the highest per capita numbers of bobcats in the whole state occur in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. So a Metroplex with, I don't know, eight or 10 million people. It's a big, big area. Uh, have bobcats that live under everybody's noses. And I got, I got the sense of that. And I got the idea for that story because I constantly was seeing postings on Facebook of people who saw bobcats in the Greenbelt areas and in city parks and even in their own backyards uh, in Dallas. So, and then I got a little jealous and I got to thinking, man, I never see bobcats around my house or I say never, I rarely see them around my house. So it made me think of one simple thing. Maybe bobcats are just really good at hiding from us. And so if you're not out there looking at them all the time, they're, they're going to be there. And so 75 yards from my house, uh, with the permission of the local game warden, I removed a dead deer off the highway that was killed near my house. And then I took that dead deer onto my property and placed it 75 yards from my house. And within the day, a bobcat and her cubs started showing up to feed on that. And I'd never seen them before. And so they were living right underneath my nose that whole time. And I just never knew they were around. Uh, by the way, my thinking is, I know there's some sensitivities on baiting animals, but that that deer was going to get eaten by animals, whether it was laying on the highway or whether it was laying on my uh, uh, on my property. So my justification is uh, I would rather lay on my property the way it could freely eat it. And it's a without endangering themselves or, or more importantly, in my mind, endangering the public at large of a big, big mammals out there trying to eat on these on these dead uh, deer laying on the road. And so uh, it was just amazing at how quick the animals showed up. And then again, they're right there in my own backyard and I never knew it. Brenda asked the question, how long do the batteries last? They last longer in warm weather than cold weather. Uh, so the way I do my setup, and again, I wish the video worked. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I may try to play through the video a little bit and pause it on just one spot so I can show you a couple things. But uh, the uh, typically, in the wintertime when it's cold here and cold in my part of Texas means it's going to be lows in the 20s, highs in the 40s during the day. Uh, they'll usually last two or three weeks. It's the camera camera batteries last plenty long. It's just the external flash batteries don't last as long. And I've actually got a couple of battery packs that I hook up to those. And the reason why they don't work long is because those Canon flashes have to stay on all the time to be ready. I think uh, the way I understand a Nikon I've got a Nikon SB400 flash, I believe, that those things will put themselves to sleep to conserve battery, but they'll come on instantly uh, when they're ready to fire. But the Canon flashes I have don't do that. So in order to, uh, in order for those things to be ready all the time, they just have to stay on all the time, and that slowly drains the batteries. I usually get, in, really, in the coldest weather we get, I may get a week, week and a half battery life out of them. During the summertime, though, I'm about to deploy the cameras or the spring. I'm about to deploy a camera probably this week again and try to get pictures of a uh, of some flying squirrels that I found. And if that's the case, that camera, I don't mind leaving it out there a couple of months to try to get the pictures. But again, this goes back to let me go back to there. This goes back to uh, I think it was Hilda who asked the question. 
does it does the glass hurt your image quality and just like the aquarium glass doesn't really affect the image quality because the lens is right against it uh and you really don't see any of the imperfections in that glass it's the same way with this camera trap because that thing's completely weather sealed it can get rained on uh it's got the hood over the top that helps keep the water off of it but still it can get rained on and and uh and really take a beating in the elements but it's weather weather sealed and so your camera inside won't get wet but again you're shooting through the glass there one thing i need to point out too is if you notice on the side and it also has on the bottoms the tripod mounts uh for these cameras and I always mount mine on the tripod when i see it in the field but again got the bobcat in the lower right i told you the story about the bobcats and why i did that the other ones uh the the doe and the fawn and then even the feral pig in the upper right they were all taken on the exact same trail as these two deer were and uh you know granted i live in the country and not in the city and i, I have a little bit of acreage or where these pictures are taken where it was on my former home in northwest texas near the town of childress i lived about four or five miles out of town out on uh, some acreage out there and these pictures and i hardly ever saw these animals at all during the day but these pictures were literally less than 50 yards from my back door and uh it's amazing all the animals that would travel that trail at night and it was a trail that was going to a, a watering station where i'd water them but it was amazing how many animals came through there and just really over time you start telling that story of the animals and the again the the, the nightlife of animals that you share share that i've shared my property with that for the most part during the day i would just never see them but at night under the cloak of darkness they were a little more comfortable and every time they'd walk in front of the camera they would uh they'd get their picture made and it's a lot of fun to do that i'm gonna let the let the i'm gonna jump forward on this a little bit and you can see this so what this what this video is and again i'll share a link with you where you can watch this on your when you get a chance uh had a neighbor who uh had a cow die and then so i went and got the cow and then moved it over to my property because my thought is uh well, on their property, the cow was in tall grass. And again, something's going to eat it, whether it eats on his property or my property is immaterial to me. So you can see, you can see there in that frame stop that uh, my setup, of course, in the background, you, there's my truck, but there's the camera trap that's actually sitting on a tripod that's pretty close to that cow. And then to the left, it looks like a plastic bag because it is. That was my off-camera flash that I had set. I had a weather sealed in a Ziploc bag, and that's what went what went missing. And then I'll show you a little close up. So there's really the close up of the rig. So this is two parts that I married together. Part one is the housing, and then part two is this little piece. This is a passive infrared transmitter, and so that what it does is every time an animal moves in front of a uh, of it it senses the motion and then it connects via cord to my camera and it fires my camera it's like a remote shutter release that you would use it uses the same type of cord uh and plugs in the camera the same way but but what fires it is instead of my thumb is the 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 electronics guru who built that passive infrared sensor for me and that cam traptions company sells those infrared sensors as well but my first iteration of a camera trap before you could buy these housings, I made my own housing and I had a guy in Nebraska uh, that's got a company called TRL cam that he, he specializes in making these triggers. And uh, so that's what I did. So Brenda asked, what setting do you use typically on a, on a camera trap setting? I will set my camera on aperture priority. And if you, if you watch the webinar I did a while back, it was all about, uh, it was all about what, why I use aperture priority because I did a crunch and of the 600 plus thousand images in my library, about 80% of them were taken using aperture priority. I like controlling the aperture and letting the camera do the heavy lifting. So aperture priority on that. And then the flashes, the wireless flash setup, it's a TTL. I don't know how familiar you guys are with the flash technology, but TTL means through the lens metering. And so the camera, and the lenses communicate with one another, another to figure out what the flash output ought to be and what the exposure ought to be. And they work in concert together to create a adequate exposure. So 
as I go back and look at these, all of these were set with my camera on aperture priority. And with the flashes attached, the camera knows what to do from there. So the camera has actually calculated the exposure on all these and uh, on the flash ones. And then all I did was just set the camera up and, and let it take pictures and go back and check later. Now I'm going to show you another screen grab on this because I'm assuming it's still going to be choppy. But I let that camera sit out there for three weeks. Oh, hang on. I'm going to go back to this one. Yeah, that's so that's what's missing right there. If you see that. A Ziploc bag with, with a flash and a battery pack in it. That's what I'm looking for. Don't know what happened to it. So luckily I use one of my older flashes and the battery packs. You can buy them used uh, off of uh, like, like KEH. And those battery packs, the way they work is they take six AA batteries that powers the flash. And those aren't very expensive either. I can go back and buy one. And so I can rebuy everything. I'm not out a lot of money. It's just bums me out that I actually lost it and can't find it and have no clue what happened to it. But anyway, there's the flash set up together. Oh, I'll show you that. That's how the, when you open the back, that's how the camera sits in there. That's the, no, that's a 60D camera. I, I, I told you wrong. That's not the 40D. That 60D has that articulating screen, but I use them with the battery grip. And so it, it'll hold two batteries instead of one. And then that just makes the battery last longer. But if you see here, Again, there's uh, there's the camera. It's got the wide angle lens. It's sticking through the port in front. This is the wireless flash controller. These are pretty inexpensive to buy. You can buy the dedicated Canon ones or Nikon or whatever that are a little more expensive, but these are just kind of a third party unit. I think they're probably 10 or $15 a piece. They're not very expensive, but what they do is they communicate. They send a radio signal from the camera to the flash and tell the flash when to fire, and uh, it works pretty seamlessly. And then you can see kind of a hint at the bottom left of the camera. There's a cord there, and that's actually the cord that comes from the passive infrared sensor and uh, plugs into the camera. And there's that's me. If you see me pointing out, explain all that. So here's my point. Three. Here's the thing about camera trapping, because you can't control when the button gets pushed and you can't control what all uh, the camera takes a picture of. Sometimes like this, you end up getting pictures of a dead cow with buzzards on it. So I've got, I ended up taking 3,000 pictures of buzzards sitting on this dead cow with nothing else on it. So that experiment, well, you can see one of the pictures there. That experiment was a little bit of a bust. Did get a few pictures that are kind of compelling of just kind of the circle of life. Oh, I take it back. I did get one picture of a coyote that was standing behind it, but never got... I, I imagined a bunch of coyotes eating on it one time. They were bobcats and getting all kinds of cool pictures, but it uh, it didn't work out that way. But, you know, it's still fun to try. Oh, there's a possum too. I got, you got to love possums. But anyway, it just talks, the rest of that video just talks about some of the pictures you saw and some of the experiences I've had with camera trapping. But again, a lot of fun. If you never tried that before, that's one of the innovations. So, I think I'm getting down to the last one. I'll go ahead and back up a little bit. Let me remind you, stack and teleconverters. Uh, it's a it's a great way to just to get a, a, an effect like a big moon or it even works good if you're not shooting through a whole lot of air to help maintain sharpness if you're shooting uh, pictures of birds or, or any other kind of small animals up close. Extension tubes, I'd highly recommend buying extension tubes. Again, just one of my goals this year is I want to get really good at macro photography. I I feel like of all the nature photography genres that I'm not that strong at, it's micro as macro photography. I got inspired by looking on Instagram at a dude who, and I can't remember his name, but he takes pictures of like honeybees in flight and they're just, they're beautiful and they're just real close up. And so uh, I, I want to get good at macro photography. And one way of doing that to get started is using extension tubes. Greg ask uh, 12 millimeter versus 25 millimeter on extension tubes. So 12 millimeter will let you focus a little bit closer. The, the, and again, I'm no optical physicist, so I can't tell you why this works, but the more extension tube you have on it, the closer your lens will be able to focus. And a lot of times, Greg, I'll use a 25 and a 12 together. And then that way this, my 70 to 200 millimeter zoom lens that I use will focus just maybe maybe six inches away. And I can't explain this either, but it's a two-step focus you do on the uh, when you're using extension tubes on mine. And the first step is 
you use the zoom to twist the zoom and that kind of gets it in focus and then you can press the button to, to for to refine the focus on whatever you're taking the pictures a picture of and so for example on these flowers when i first look at them through extension tubes and again these things are inches away from these flowers uh again use the zoom ring to zoom in and out to obtain initial focus and to refine the focus and make sure it's in focus i just tap the button like i was taking pictures of anything else so yeah to circle back on your question greg uh I sound like the White House spokes spokesperson when I just use that term. I apologize for that. That's a that's a trite term used in our society. Circle back, but to go back and answer your question again, twelve millimeter will will effectively allow a lens to focus a little bit closer, twenty five even closer than that. But when you combine the two, you can get really close focus on on the lens, and it really depends on the lens too. Uh, if you use a lens like a like a macro lens that will already focus close, a 12 millimeter extension tube will give you a hyper focus, close focusing. Uh, it'll even do a lot closer if I use a 50 millimeter, like a 1.4 lens that I have. You can really zoom in and get, uh, I mean, you can really get a lot closer focusing. But my preference on flowers and stuff like that to give me a little bit of working distance and more importantly to get the backgrounds like I look, I really like that compressed look that a telephoto can give you. So that's why... I, I use my extension tubes on the uh, on my 70 to 200 lens a lot. Hope that answers that question. Here, I'll, I'm going to go through and do a screen grab on this too to show you kind of the takeaway. So to, to explain this story, that's my son there in the background. We were in southern Missouri in the Ozarks at a friend's place. Went there on a fishing trip. Rained a bunch. The rivers got up. We didn't get to fish. So we went out and my son's an avid wildlife photographer too, so we went out looking for frogs because all these mud holes you see in the on the road were full of tadpoles, and so we went out looking for frogs and photographing frogs. And uh, I just talk about my simple setup in this. Let me find it. And there it is. That's my frog photography setup: seventy to two hundred millimeter lens. I've got the twelve millimeter extension tube on it there because I. You know, I still had to maintain a working distance because you couldn't get right on top of the frogs or they'd jump away. So I had still had to maintain a little bit of distance and to add a pop of color to them because it was overcast, just, just use an external flash on the, this time instead of using a wireless flash controller, I just uh, had the cord on it and, it and it works remarkably well if you're shooting pictures of frogs. You can see there just a 12 millimeter extension tube. It works remarkably well uh, as a setup and I'll show you some. That's when we went out at night. Let me get to the end here. I'll show you a few pictures. Yeah, so that's uh, that was taken at ground level with the extension tubes. That's a couple of toads mating in a puddle. Uh, again, just to give a pop of color, I just held the flash up high, let it do indirect light right on top of it. The camera does all the heavy lifting, and uh, and it's uh. It's a pretty simple way. I was actually going to add one of the things I was going to add to this presentation today, but I, I decided against it. it was using flash for wildlife photography. Every now and then you'll see people doing it. I'm, sometimes I'm a fan of it. Sometimes I'm not. I'm more of a fan of doing it like this on reptiles and amphibians when the light source can come from more overhead instead of right from the camera because I think it looks a little nat more natural. But you've seen people... I've seen people use flash on the camera that fires it through like a Fresnel lens to, to magnify the flash on birds and stuff. And I've certainly done that before, but that's more of a direct flash straight from the camera. And in my opinion, it doesn't look good because that would be like us looking at everything with the sun on our chest shining straight at whatever we look at. We're used to seeing the light come from all different directions around us falling on the subject. And so for reptiles and amphibians, uh, again, that's why that off camera setup that I use for not only this, but also the lizard and, and even the, the crawfish and the pictures where I talk about using the tank, they were all shot the same way. But again, here's, that's a picture, just simple setup, flash extension tube on the lens and just finding the frog to shoot that picture. And you can kind of get a sense of where the flash is coming from. It's to up and to the right a little bit because of the reflection you can see on the, uh, on the uh on that frogs i don't even know what you call that if anybody knows what you call that part of a frog uh let me know 
just like a it's their throat that they extend, but I don't even know what that's called. But when you can get that camera off the flash, it's just a lot more natural look to me. And that's where we're just experimenting with a couple of different settings and then moving the flash around to get more something that kind of approximated night time a little more. But yeah, that's that's what me and uh my son, his name is Ryan, but we uh around the backcountry journeys tribe, we refer to him as a double homeboy because he's such a good kid. He's not just one homeboy, but he's two. He's such a good kid. There he is right there. So like like most parents, I'm partial to my children, and he's a, he's a good one. And again, the aquarium, like I said on the, on this one, the flash was actually held right above the the uh, the lizard, shot through a scrim just to soften the light. Y'all have seen soft boxes before used in portrait photography, and that's using the same thing in this. But I used a a, a flash on all three of these pictures as well, just to approximate light coming from above like you would see in nature. And then camera traps, you know, I can talk about those things all day because it's a great tool to use for a whole camera trap setup. I didn't mention this. Well, let me back up for all the things I suggest stack and teleconverters. Uh, I have both the two X and the 1.4. So that didn't cost me any extra money. Extension tubes. If you buy the Canon ones are about a hundred or if you buy like me for Canon, the Canon ones are about a hundred bucks a piece. Roughly, I bought mine used, so I didn't pay that much for them uh, because, again, there's no glass in the middle. As long as the electrical contacts are good, I don't care how beat up they are uh, because they still work just as well. You can buy third party. Again, the people on the on the Backcountry Journeys trip we did last week, they uh, they had some aftermarket third party extension tubes. They said they paid $40 for a set of them. So super affordable way to get macro, do macro photography. Uh Aquariums, like I said, they're a little bit disposable. You can always reuse them uh, in your house to grow plants in or whatever. A little bit disposable, but they're uh, as long as you take care of them and don't get the glass scratched up. And then if you think about it this way, you still have four sides of glass you can work with. They work pretty good for a long time because, again, it just they don't cost much at all. And if you take care of them, they'll last a long time. Camera trap setup, if you got the existing stuff, that housing right there, I think, was a couple of hundred dollars, uh, but it's money well spent, in my opinion. A couple of hundred bucks for that. The uh, the wireless flash controllers are, again, pretty cheap. You have to buy a transmitter and a receiver, and those things, if you, don't, if you just buy the third-party ones you can find on Amazon, I want to say they're, like I said, 15 bucks a piece. They're really cheap as well. And then I would advocate because of what happened to me, go out and buy a used flash, you know, a third or fourth generation flash. It still works with your camera, but uh, may not be the latest and greatest that your camera manufacturer has to offer. So that way, if you lose it, you're, you're bummed about it like I am, but it's not the end of the world because things do happen. And the bad thing is I don't have a picture of the culprit that took my flash either. And then this is a, Fairly new technique I've been working on lately, but believe it or not, it works exceedingly well, and that's GoPro pics. Uh, if you've been on a backcountry journey trip with me, you know I'll tote my GoPro around with me all the time. And uh, Greg, I'm going to pick on you. I don't have the picture in here because I haven't got it processed yet, but I think you were with me when I took one of the pics using a GoPro. Uh, well, before I go any further, Lynn asked the question, are the camera trap bodies specific to a camera body? No, they're universal. They make them big enough where just about any camera will fit. So you don't have to buy a, a Canon housing that's made specifically for your Canon camera. They're not like uh, the underwater housing. So you just, they have, it's kind of a one size fits all. But back to the GoPro pics, one of the things I've been doing a lot lately, especially in shallow water, I'm a, Excuse me, I'm a certified scuba diver, but I, uh, you know, the if you've ever scuba dove with a camera before, they're big and cumbersome, and it's a lot of equipment, and they're kind of hard to to uh, to handle, especially on land. But increasingly, I've been using a GoPro to do underwater pictures, especially fi uh, pictures of fish and other animals that live in really shallow water. Uh, for example, this picture here was taken with a GoPro, 
it's of a cutthroat trout in uh in out in Wyoming when I was out there doing some pictures a couple of years ago. But I used a uh, I used a GoPro with a dome port to be able to kind of do that slice through the water look. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll use my GoPro, attach it to a tripod that way or a monopod that way I've got a little bit of a reach. And if there's fish swimming around, I'll stick them underwater and try to. You can set your camera a couple ways with the GoPro. One. You can either do just where it does a continual picture every couple of seconds, and I'll do that sometimes. Put the GoPro underwater and just let it automatically take pictures, and then the fish will be swimming around it, and I'll be able to get pictures of the fish. Or number two, and this is something that really works really well as well. Uh, I've been uh, doing a video and then capturing still frames out of the video, and that works well as that works good as well. So, but with the GoPro pics. Uh, you can see these are all real shallow water fish. They live in a foot or two of water, not much at all. Something you can't scuba dive in, but uh, it, it works. And this is a little brown trout I took up in uh, Oklahoma. And then what I did in Florida that Greg saw is I was taking pictures of a uh, alligator gar that were living in a in a little swamp, about a, two feet of water. And then this is I took this on the Katmai trip. So when you go on the Katmai trip, uh, you'll notice there's a lot of fish that 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 are swimming around around your feet. And so again, just with the GoPro on a pole or on a monopod or a tripod, I'll just stick the camera underwater and shoot a few pictures of it. And so that brings me to this question. What's your big idea? Uh, do y'all have any, any, uh, y'all have any, uh, ideas on what you do for, for wildlife or nature photography that's kind of beyond the norm and kind of thinking about ways to get pictures of, of uh, animals in kind of non-traditional circumstances, I'll put it. And while you are thinking about that, Jeff says, underwater housings are not bad if you have them. Slightly negative bu buoyancy. Yeah, I use a nautical housing with my EM1 Mark II with some buoyant light arms, and it works very well. Yeah, if uh, you're, you're right, Jeff. I, I do have mine manageable, too when you make them slightly negatively buoyant, that means they'll sink a little bit. But, you know, again, for, for like these fish here, I guess I could have taken underwater housing, but it's pretty handy to use that GoPro because it's so small and it's pretty portable. And if I need to use it, I can, if I don't, I don't have to. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's again, a way to put, shoot some pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal pictures with not a whole lot of gear. And these have a little bit of color correction, but not much at all. So, and that's it. Well, I ended up taking up 50 minutes for, despite the, the uh, flubs with the video, but here's the thing. Oh, does anybody have any questions so far? And while you're thinking about that, I'll go ahead and share this with you. Yeah. Jeff says it'd be hard to pack just for that. You're, you're right. Cause the underwater housing I have is heavy. It's got its own case that I use for it. And it's more for deep water stuff, but just for the pictures I just showed you, the shallow water stuff, the GoPros work remarkably well. And the GoPros, they won't, you know, they don't, they're so small, you can put them in there with the fish and typically they won't get spooked by it. But uh, yeah, stay in touch with me. So the videos that I was going to show you are actually on the website there, wildlifephotoshow.com. That's a little side project that I do. If you want to subscribe and I've got a bunch of new videos coming out soon. And you'll get notification. That's the only thing I use that that subscribe for is to let people know when new videos come out. I don't spam you with anything at all because there's nothing to sell there. Uh, it's just for people like me and you who are photography enthusiasts, particularly wildlife photography enthusiasts who uh, just love be nature and love being outdoors and love wildlife. But you can go to wildlifephotoshow.com and take a look at that frog party. I think it's like episode 17 or 18. Uh or look at the uh, uh, the camera trap one. I think the camera trap one's the last one I posted. So you don't have to dig back through a long through a lot of videos. But if you want to, uh, I think there's some pretty neat content on there. So take a look. It'll kind of give you a, a look of some some travel stuff, some behind the scenes stuff, and everything else. And finally, if you uh, have any questions for me, feel free to reach out. Russell at russellgraves.com. Always happy to interact with you beyond these webinars, and always happy to answer questions whenever I can and uh, 
to tell you the story about the bear there that was taken conventionally, but the bear was doing some unconventional things when we saw him. That was actually in the Smokies last week when we were there on a trip. And uh, that wet bear walked out of the woods, used a uh, cedar tree to scratch its back with for a while, wrestled with the cedar tree for a while, and then he took a good long look at us standing probably 50 yards away from it. And so that's the one of the pictures we got there. So uh, if you guys don't have any questions, I, I do appreciate your time today and spending your lunch hour. Or my, it was, it's, it's noon here in Texas. Spending some time with me here uh, as I broadcast to you live from from Bonham, Texas, and I appreciate you guys being with me today. And uh, I think I'll be back next week with another webinar, and I'll be back throughout the summer with webinars. When I'm not uh, doing this, you can catch me on one of the upcoming Backcountry Journey photo tours, or uh, or you can catch me on Facebook or Instagram or one of those other places. So, uh, again, if you have any questions beyond this, feel free to reach out to me. Love to answer them. Stay in touch, and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys in the field, and I look forward to seeing what kind of pictures that we all can make together. Take care, everybody.